Um, to be honest, after listening to all the presentations today, I feel a bit of an interloper here, because I'm coming out a totally off-the-wall approach to things here. My, f I, my focus is on questions of financial inclusion and digital identity, which means I spend almost all my working life in either Africa or South Asia. And why do I do that? Well, frankly, because it's fun. And part, part of my problem today is I don't want to convince too many of you that it's fun because it'll get too crowded. And it's so uh, Nick, uh, sorry, Dave mentioned in passing that uh, uh, we uh, did some work together originally on M-Pesa, and that's where I'm coming from today. So I'm going to talk to you a bit about biometrics. I will get there, but there is, there is a, a journey to get there. So way back in the mists of recorded time, 2004, uh, we, took, we got a call at Hyperion, Consult Hyperion, for somebody to come and help with uh, something to do with mobile phones and money. Uh, a guy called Nick Hughes at, MP at um, Vodafone had been asked to do some work there, and he had the idea that we could, be able, we could do something there, but he didn't know what. So uh, because I was the person in Hyperion who did the kind of off-the-wall, non-mainstream stuff, I ended up taking the call, and as a result of that, I've spent a lot of time in Kenya. Um, mostly, obviously, in the populated bits. And what I re find really interesting is if you look at a network coverage, a, a mobile network coverage map of Kenya, you can see where everyone lives. So this, is there a laser thing on this? No? Okay, so that's the main road linking uh, Nairobi to Mombasa on the coast. This is where a lot of people live because it's next to the sea. And that's where most of the business is done. And there's uh, quite a bit goes on up there right, for agriculture and tea and coffee and uh, all that kind of thing. There's nothing over the rest of the country. And that's because there aren't that many people there. But there are some. So... Once we'd got uh, M-Pesa up and running, and our original business case, we, we put together some basic presumptions and came up with a projection for the first year of about a million people. And then we said, well, we can never sell that. Nobody will ever believe that. So we revisited, cut it all down, and said, OK, we might make 500,000, um, because we thought we could sell that. Because as we all know, that's what a business case is all about. Can you sell it to the people who have the money? So. Uh, after about a year, uh, it had reached about one and a half million. So we're feeling a bit smug about that. Um, but at that point, of course, because my, my role in this is always what's next, as opposed to the, how can we actually make this profitable, I started to look at something called the Hunger Safety Net Programme, HSMP, which is to look at all those other areas where there isn't mobile coverage and how can we deliver financial services there. And this is the kind of place that we were looking at. So we were trying to develop a service which would take M-Pesa offline and which would use biometrics to identify people, or more, more properly speaking, authenticate them, in an environment where you're going to find it hard to find anywhere to plug in your fingerprint reader for a start. And the most interesting thing I found about this was that if you found a village on the map and you went there, quite often you'd find that there was no one there. Those nomadic farmers had moved. And somebody would tell you there's another village 10 miles that way with the same name. So you're following people around trying to deliver financial services, which is an interesting challenge in itself. And think of the KYC issue here. So one of, this was my first real contact with biometrics, because these nomadic farmers were uh, living in a very dry environment. Um, they were predominantly over 50. The young people go to live and work in the cities. Um, they are uh, manual laborers. And we were trying to use fingerprints. Uh, so it didn't work terribly well. 
And when I was talking to the people who are doing the actual registration of people for this service, I was saying, well, how do you manage with all these people? And can you register them? And they said, oh, it's easy. We just turn down the machines, which to anyone who understands biometrics, you understand that that means the biometric is essentially useless. So ultimately, because we were doing this for Safaricom in Kenya, and they are actually a mobile phone company, they weren't interested in us doing this offline. So that our project, with our contribution to this was killed, but we kept the technology. So we then took it into Nigeria. Nigeria is a great place. I've just got back from Nigeria. I really like working there, but it's so stressful. Before this project, my hair was black. Ran this project for a, about a year. Here, we're delivering financial services to farmers in rural, in rural Nigeria, where there's no mobile phone coverage. And we're registering them, we're giving them an identity document, and then we're delivering services to them, all without any mobile coverage. And it worked. We'd registered half a million farmers over the course of eight, month, eight weeks, and we delivered services to them to the tune of $19 million. The only problem was the project was then killed because the civil servants in Nigeria couldn't work out how to corrupt it. So this is a registration line. We were registering people using Android tablets. We were giving them identity cards. And we were using basic biometrics. We were trying to use face biometrics. And this is one of the solutions that people came up with, um, putting a big, big bit of white paper on the wall and taking a photograph against that. And it kind of works. The problem was we discovered that the cameras on these devices are not really up to supporting the biometrics. But it was an experiment. Um, these ladies were, again, being registered. And, what's, and this is an example of the registration cards we were handing out. You'll notice that one of the cards is green, the other is black. And that's because this lady on the, on the right had some form of identity card. We could do a basic KYC on her. The lady on the left had no identity documentation at all. So we introduced the concept of sponsorship. So somebody with a green card could sponsor up to five other people. But bearing in mind that we come from a payments consultancy, we're absolutely paranoid about security. And that meant that we were linking all these cards together. And if anyone in the chain did something that we didn't approve of or looked as though it might be a little bit suspicious, the whole lot got suspended. The system was so sensitive to this that one weekend, we automatically suspended about 3,000 people. And that's where my white hair came from, <laughs> trying to sort out that problem. It was hell. So out of that program, which was a great success, even though the Nigerian civil servants hated it, we were then asked to look, go and look at Somalia. Somalia had a big issue with uh, banks de-risking. Oh, this is a picture of money changers in Somalia. These guys exist, bales of cash. Turn up with your dollars and they'll give you a handful of Somali shillings. And they do good business and they're actually pretty reliable. The only problem is none of the transactions are traceable. They don't do a KYC check on anyone who comes up. It's remarkable. So. Because of that, all of the banks were, were de-risking. And I kind of understand why. I, I felt the banks were getting so much bad publicity at the time because they were pulling out and all these poor Somalis were starving because they weren't getting their remittances from the UK and America. But on the other hand, they were, send, these, they were sending... If they sent $100 to somebody who turned out to be vaguely related to a terrorist, then they had a billion-dollar fine. So I kind of understand. But um, so we developed a proposition for a service which was based on the assumption that you can't actually be sure who anyone is in Somalia. Because oddly, if a terrorist turns up, they don't present their Al-Shabaab membership card. And if they have any form of identity documentation at all, they lose it, obviously. So we said, give them a baseline new virtual identity card, biometrically protected, and from every contact with every financial service provider in the area, we can see every single transaction. We know who they are, we know what, what their transactions were, who they interacted with. And 
this is what, about eight years ago, we were proposing using a bot to examine all the transactions from, for AML processing. So we had it all designed, all ready to go, looking for the next round of funding from the World Bank and DFID, and it was killed by the US Treasury because we could not absolutely guarantee that a terrorist might not receive $10 from this. Now, given the fascination with real identities that the regulators have, I wonder how anyone ever does a transaction anywhere in the world, frankly. So, all of these services relied on uh, biometrics in some form or other. And from that, I've tried to draw some conclusions. Oh, yeah, there's one more. Um, I was working in India, looking at the delivery of money to, under this RISB program, to essentially poor people in rural India. How do you, how do you support them remotely? India, India is a vast place, one and a quarter billion people. And the Adhar program is a huge achievement. They've, re they've managed to issue a digital identity to every single resident of India. Notice, not Indians, residents of India. And it's biometrically protected. There's no card involved, unlike the RISB card. It's all, you have your Adhar number, and you can use that to verify your identity online. And you can use it for everything in India now. And it's universal acclaim by everyone in the NGO community, governments, World Bank, everybody loves that hell. And I found it remarkable. India have covertly managed to create, no, Indian, no one from the Indian government here? No? They've managed to create the world's second largest mass surveillance program in the world. Everything you do is recorded by the government. And if they chose to, they could they, could, they know every aspect of your life. It's quite remarkable how they've got away with that. Um, but what's particularly interesting about what they did in terms of Adhar was that they didn't record a single biometric. You if you register for Adhar now, they record your 10 fingerprints, if you have them, both irises, and a face. They'll find a biometric that works somewhere. So, I'm going to talk about the myth and reality. It's true, biometrics do hold significant promise, and maybe at some time in the future, they will be the basis of identica identification and authentication for pretty much every service you rely on. But they really are not as straightforward or, or as reliable as CSI suggests. The, prob the biggest problem is it's an extremely difficult set of technologies to do properly. And it's very easy to do it badly. And the worst part is, it's almost impossible to tell the difference. Yep. So first off, myth number one. A fingerprint biometric profile is not the same as a fingerprint at all. We all know what a fingerprint looks like. Most people who think about biometrics think that that's what we use. But it's not. We take points on the fingerprint. We try and identify as many points as possible. On a good day, you might get 20. On a bad day, as I tend to see, it's more like four or five. And then we try and establish the spatial relationship between those points. So it's a statistical analysis of the points. Now, as you can see, therefore, a fingerprint profile is not the same as a fingerprint. An important message from that is the quality is related to the number of points, and these are not unique. I did a quick calculation for India and worked out that any single fingerprint profile that you capture in India can be matched by up to 10,000 other Indians. Because you don't know which 10,000, and in a country of one and a quarter billion, it might be a bit tricky to find them, because I assume they're randomly spread across the whole continent. But that's an important point. And there's also a confusion between identification and authentication. 
And this is the basis of a lot of misuse. So by identification, it means I don't know who, who you are when you come up. You present me with your fingerprint, and from that, I can work out who you are. Uh-uh, it -uh, doesn't work. It's virtually impossible. Authentication, though, where, you, where I've previously onboarded you, and I've issued you with a biometric profile which you have on a card or is on a server somewhere, whatever it may be, that works. And it works pretty reliably. Assuming there's decent quality, of course. So to identify an individual, I first have to have a national database of some sort. So it can only be done at all if there is a centralized database, so everybody's fingerprint profiles on, on a da database somewhere. I mean, Adhar have that. There is a huge database in, in Delhi, where, or New Delhi, where all of the biometrics are stored. So in principle, it's possible to identify if you turn up with just your finger. But it doesn't work, because you're trying to, tra first off, you're trying to match my fingerprint against one and a quarter billion others, so there's a huge computational task. And secondly, as I said, there's up to 10,000 Indians that would match. So forget it. Um, even where there's a suitable database, like uh, British police earlier this year had a database of about a few hundred people, criminals that they wanted to, identify, to catch. And they were using uh, cameras to capture facial biometrics from a crowd. And they got 90% false positives. And 90% false positives is possibly even worse than not even trying. It just doesn't work at all. And until the technology is vastly improved, it, it will not. I keep on pointing to that screen. Authentication, a lot more straightforward. So if you bring me your national identity card with a biometric stored on it, like the one in Pakistan, or the uh, central database, like in India, and you tell me uh, your, uh, you give me your biometric, I can match it. The way they do it in India is instead of a card, they, give, they use the Aadhaar number. And you're supposed to remember your Aadhaar number as an Indian. Everyone does, because it's the basis of access to everything in your life. So it actually works remarkably well. And obviously, as a bank, so I work in the uh, developing world where banks are FSPs, financial service providers. When you onboard a customer, you might want to identify the customer user using a biometric. So it's ideal if there's a national identity service. So you, you give me your identity card, you authenticate use yourself using a fingerprint, and the card or the service might release some attributes, like your name and address. It makes it much easier. And then I, as a bank, might issue a derived identity from that with its own biometric, which is under my control. You don't do that in India because you have to have Adhar doing it for you. But anywhere else, you do it yourself. But in each case, the point to be made is that the biometric matching is one-to-one, -one, never the one-to-many matching, because that, as I say again and again, it doesn't work. Another point, any one biometric doesn't work for everyone. Um, you have to think about the population that you're working with. So fingerprints, they don't work for anyone over the age of 50, uh, or reliably anyway. They work remarkably well for government ministers and biometric salesmen. But for most other people, it's not terribly, terribly, terribly reliable. Voice can be very difficult to use with mobile phones. If people have a cheap mobile phone, guess what? There's a cheap microphone in it. And voice biometrics don't work for a lot of the population. Face has so many issues. Um, not least that we found it's actually quite racist. It doesn't work on black faces, which is a real challenge, frankly. Um, and the, there's two possible explanations for that. First off, the algorithms that are in place were either developed in the, in the Far East or on the west coast of America, where there simply aren't the test cases, or it's simply contrast. I, there are ways of getting around that. For example, the Apple approach with the uh, infrared dots to get the shape of the structure of the face it actually has a lot of uh, potential there, but it's, it's just not cheap enough. 
And then there's cultural issues. People do have sensitivities. If you go around uh, uh, putting your phone up to people's eyes to do a uh, iris biometric, for example, they don't like it. Finger vein is another popular one. People I've met have a real problem with sticking their finger in this tube. This doesn't make people feel very comfortable. Um, so the point is, any service which relies on biometrics shouldn't just settle on one. You have to have a few, and you choose the one which is usable by your particular customer that is in front of you. And yet, biometrics work. It shouldn't do, but it does. In all the services I've worked with, I've found that the level of fraud, if you put biometric authentication on, is not zero, but very close to zero. And that this, to me, is the power of magical thinking. People have seen all the television programs about fingerprints and dusting for fingerprints and the absolute uh, uh, infallibility of it, and they believe it. So they don't even try to defeat it, even if you could pick up somebody's card in certainly Nigeria and anyone could use it. They don't try. And for now, that's why it works. The point is, we have to make sure that the technology improves before people catch on. So thank you all. <laughs>